the best way of getting acquainted with the region's natural sites and animal world is accompanied by experienced specialists. We are starting our expedition in the city of Aktau. We are currently visiting Odilbek Kozibakov, board chairperson of the Tabigi Orta Association. Our film crew will join the monitoring expedition organized jointly by the public inspection of the West Kazakhstan Regional Association of Environmental, Non-Governmental Organizations and German Nature Conservation Society, NABU. The first interesting location is at the very beginning of our expedition. I mean the specially protected area in the vicinity of the local desalination plant. Mayak Kazatom Prom was launched in 1968 and the same year the artificial Karakol Lake started forming. Since Karakol water is warmer than this in the sea, various organisms started coming in. First the algae, then crustaceans and even later the reeds. At the time of creation, a fast neutron reactor at the Mungistown nuclear power plant was used to desalinate seawater for the first time in the world. There were no natural fresh water reservoirs in the area, but the rapidly growing city and developing oil industry required a lot of water. Ten years later, Israel, using the successful Mangistau experience, began to build its own desalination plants. Disputes between supporters and opponents of peaceful nuclear energy have been going on for many years and finally, in 2021, the European Commission Working Group officially recognized nuclear energy as environmentally friendly. The inexhaustible source of fresh water allows the Israelis not only satisfying all their water needs, but also exporting agricultural products to other countries. At present, the Mangistau power plant operates on gas and provides the area not only with fresh water, but also with heat and electricity. Birds have come to like the artificial lake and a specially protected natural territory was organized here. In total, up to 170 avian species live here during various seasons of the year, including 22 red-listed species, flamingo, whooping swan, bowick swan, eagle owl, spoonbill, glory ibis and many others. Brown ducks with vertically raised tails and blue noses are called stifftails or safki in Russian. Flamingos start nesting at the age of three. Prior to that, young birds form bachelor groups. We would probably be uncomfortable sleeping on one leg, but this posture does not seem to cause any discomfort for flamingos. Hiding one leg under the plumage, the birds can save a little precious heat. The tourist flow to the lake is controlled by the inspectors of the Ustuot Reserve. This is a potentially attractive place for tourists. We should not forget that this is a conservation area and an extremely vulnerable ecosystem. The beginning of our expedition coincided with the awarding of the staff of the Tabigi Orta West Kazakhstan Regional NGO Association with honorary diplomas. It is great that the citizens engaged in environmental efforts are commended and congratulated for what they do. It inspires and gives strength to continue our work. Nurbol Okuov and Adilbek Kozibakov also received awards for their contribution to environmental conservation. Recently, Adilbek Kozibakov was elected deputy chairperson of the coordinating committee of the Ramsar Regional Initiative for Central Asia. The Ramsar Convention got its title from the city where it was signed. Currently, Kazakhstan has 10 globally significant wetlands. I often go on field trips. 
The natural wealth of our region is simply overwhelming. It is impossible to show you everything. However, I hope that what we will be able to capture will be interesting to your audience. No more talking. Off we go. Before traveling around Mangistau and Ustiot, one should definitely stop by the Museum of Local Lore in Agtau to get an idea about the region's history and culture. A huge desert plateau with the area exceeding 200 square kilometers spreads between the Caspian and Darrell Seas. Since ancient times, local residents called the steep cliffs chinks. By now, this word has entered the international geographical science as an official term. These pictures gorges were once bays of ancient seas that replaced each other in different geological eras. In the Mesozoic, the primary ocean Thetis was splashing its waves here. 14 million years ago, only its relic called the Sarmatian Sea remained uniting the modern Aral and Caspian Seas. Three million years ago, the entire Caspian lowland was flooded with the Akchagilian Sea, and a million years ago, the Apsheronian Sea existed on the site of the modern Caspian Sea. Its shores were characterized by the tropical climate and inhabited by the first hominids. Traces of the ancient seas of the Ustuot cliffs are not difficult to find. Coming across shark teeth, petrified mollusks and bones of ancient fish on mountain tops, you begin to understand the geological history of our planet much better. Here's another legacy of the ancient seas. What kind of giant had scattered these cannonballs around? In fact, the spherical concretions formed in the silt of the ancient ocean with calcium gradually accumulating around negatively charged nucleuses. In the Paleolithic, the local climate was wetter and milder. Rivers flowed to the Caspian Sea, along which humans settled. The Koskuduk I on the Tupkaragan Peninsula, dating back to the 5th millennium BC, represents the most famous of the Enneolithic Age ancient human dwelling sites. In the Bronze Age, the first nomadic civilizations began to form here. In the middle of the last century, flying on the plane, geologists noticed some arrow-looking lines similar to the geoglyphs in the Nazca Desert in Peru. Ufologists immediately announced their extraterrestrial origin, but the mystery was quickly resolved by zoologists. The accumulation of bones of wild animals, red sheep, goited gazelles and saigai in the special traps on the tips of those arrows indicated that the ancient hunters used stone barriers for collective raids. Apparently, the number of wild ungulates in those days was very high here. It remained high until the beginning of the economic development of Mangistau in the second half of the 20th century. According to scientists of that time, in the 70s of the last century, the total Jiran population on the territory of Mangistau and Ustuot amounted to 100,000, and now it barely reaches 800 animals. In the Middle Ages, one of the branches of the Great Silk Road passed through the Ustuot Plateau. During numerous wars in Persia and the Eastern Mediterranean, southern merchant caravans were forced to bypass the Caspian from the north. There were periods when the rulers could not provide security for caravans, and trade got quiet for a while and then flourished again when a new strong figure capable of restoring the order appeared on the political horizon. The visit to the museum allowed our crew expanding the knowledge of region's history, but it's time for us to go to the Kenderli Bay. But first, let's get acquainted with the remaining expedition members. Since childhood, I like to watch all sorts of programs about wild animals, where cool specialists would go to unique places and film gorgeous animals. When I grew up, I also decided to become such a person. 
and entered the biology department of Karaganda State University. Each person has his or her own scale of life values. They can change with age, but young people usually choose a profession primarily at the behest of their heart. I love my job immensely. Given an early childhood, as my mom told me, I enjoyed observing all the insects that I found. Already in the 11th grade, I decided to enter the biology department. I studied there at the zoology chair for six years and completed my first four years of undergraduate studies majoring in lapidopterology. I worked with butterflies. Then immediately after the bachelor's course, I entered the master's course to study rodents. You can't call a zoologist fieldwork a walk in the park, as they have to stoutly bear all the hardships of camping life, but it is all worth the beauty of wildlife. I delved into the issues of preserving the animal world and preserving Kazakhstan's ecosystems. I was lucky enough to meet many experts, biologists who devoted their entire lives to this cause. I've also been able to visit many countries, such as the US, Georgia, Germany, Kyrgyzstan and other Central Asian countries. I personally saw how they protect their nature what approaches and mechanisms they apply to preserve the animal and plant worlds. Ibat is still a young specialist, but has already acquired a lot of field experience. He cooperates with various international organizations, such as the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and Germany's Union for the Conservation of Nature and Biodiversity, abbreviated as NABU. Foreign conservationists pay special attention to the conservation of Saiga, since 90% of the global Saiga population lives in Kazakhstan. In my third year of undergraduate studies, I got into my first rodent expedition. This work went on for five years. As a matter of fact, since 2015 I had become a real field worker. Then I enhanced my competencies thanks to studying in Germany. I received a project grant and studied there for nine months. There I had slightly changed my focus and went into tourism as the main tool for environmental management. Many wild animals lead a very secretive lifestyle. Studying them in a natural environment is not easy. Most of us will not even be able to see them from afar. Nurlikhan Ismailov is sharing his field experience with young colleagues. I came to Mangustau in 1996 and have been living here ever since. I graduated the forestry department and have been engaged in nature conservation since then, observing nature and installing photo traps. Field researchers have recently received a new and extremely effective tool, photo traps. They allow making videos and pictures of the most rare and very cautious animals, desert lynx or caracal, for instance. From the city of Aktau, our expedition is moving along the Caspian Sea coast towards the Kenderli Bay. Along the way, we make a stop at the Karagia Depression. We are now at the edge of the Karagia Depression. Its absolute elevation is minus 132 meters according to the Baltic system. This is one of the deepest depressions in the world and the lowest place in Kazakhstan and the CIS. Interestingly, usually the Argali inhabit high mountains and here, in the Ustuot mountains, they live in the depression. 
In addition, there are several wild cat species here as well as jayrans. Uh, We are at the Caspian Sea coast. Wandering along it, you can encounter a lot of small animals. Stent is an experienced hunter. It masterfully picks invertebrates from the coastal algae. Tessellated water snake is an absolutely harmless and even useful creature. Please don't kill them if you see them. Red-headed bunting is a most common bird, but a real trophy for photo hunter. Fast lizards are in the middle of a true performance. Will someone eat someone next second? No, it's just a kind of courtship. We are in the shallow Kender Lee Bay. A few kilometers from the coast, there is a sandbar of the same name where seals often gather to rest. This local level nature reserve, Adam Taz, is under the protection of the Kizil Sai Regional Nature Park. Its tasks include not only protecting seals and animals from poachers, but also monitoring and preventing coastal pollution, primarily hazardous discharge from ships. Caspian seal is a Caspian Sea endemic. In the early 20th century, up to 1 million of them inhabited the Caspian Sea, but now only about 50,000 of them are left. The animal is included in the red list of Kazakhstan. The fine for killing it amounts to 8 million tenge, but unfortunately, poaching is not the only reason causing the reduction of seal population. Marine pollution poses a much larger threat. Cormorants and Caspian gulls formed a whole city on the sandbar. Together it is easier to defend against predators. These are common birds and they are not threatened by anything. On the contrary, the number of cormorants has been annually growing and their habitat has been expanding creating an ecological imbalance. Their rapid expansion has been stimulating additional food competition, harming rarer waterfowl species and reducing fish stock. So we got an idea of the Caspian coast. Our next destination is Mount Bos Giran. A good asphalt road leads to it from the village of Janaozen. This road was built last year. It leads to the Beket Atta Mosque. Since the road got better, respectively more tourists started coming here. The Bos Jira natural landmark is located on the right side of the road. It's only about 20 kilometers from the paved road to Bos Jira, but you can cover it only on an SUV. We've been seeing that this country SUV road to Bos Jira has been constantly expanding. In fact, we're talking about five to six individual roads going in parallel. During the spring flood period, the drivers prefer getting out of the ditches on the central road into the open terrain and thus expand the main road. I'd say that having one good paved road would cause less damage to the vegetation cover than dozens of these improvised country roads. There was a lot of discussion in the press and social media regarding the plan to build an elite hotel near Bosjura. The opinions expressed were quite different. Some strongly objected to any construction, while others suggested building a hotel at a distance from the famous mountain. Others proposed raising the environmental status of the adjacent territory, developing one two tourist routes and prohibiting the uncontrolled off-road driving in this specially protected area. President Kasim Jomar Tokayev instructed the government to hold public hearings on the project and conduct an environmental impact assessment.
The third group supported the idea of building only a small visit center and allowing the locals to develop eco and ethnic tourism. What is your take on that? In general, I am for the visit centers, but if they decide that it is necessary to build a hotel complex, I am for it to be built without violating all this beauty around. A visit center, of course, is the best option, but if we are talking about a hotel, then I'm in favor of building it next to the settlements, so that local residents could get jobs. Recently, the Ostjord has become very popular among auto tourism enthusiasts. I'm not against the hotel, but on the way here we saw so many roads that harmed the landscape and animal migration. Thus, it appears to me that it's better to build one good road so that everyone can drive along it year-round without disturbing the soil cover. Until recently, the Ustjort was considered one of the most inaccessible locations on the planet. Rare extreme travel enthusiasts dared to cross the plateau on custom trucks. Picturesque photos quickly scattered across social networks and now thousands of SUVs are already driving around the Ustjort. I think it's probably necessary to build several observation platforms so that people drive along the same road and can admire the surroundings. When everybody is driving on his own, sooner or later there will be nothing left of the original view. It would be nice to arrange a small visit center with the necessary amenities for tourists. Water, bathrooms, Wi-Fi, parking and of course a small platform where local residents could install their yurts and sell their goods. Our expedition continues. All photographers who come to the Ustio dream of meeting the Trans-Caspian Uriel. We are no exception either. On the slopes of Tuzbair Sor or Salt Lake, we came across these horns. The picturesque canyons of Tuzbair Salt Lake are striking. Apparently, once there were a lot of Orioles here, but so far we have only managed to encounter a colony of large gerbils and a brood of partridges. To our joy, the partridges turned out very trusting and let us come as close as 20 meters. Finding an old skull is by no means the limit of our dreams. We will try finding the red Oriole sheep on the Tupkaragan Peninsula. You need to get up before dawn. During the day, Orioles hide from the sun in the niches and among rocks, so it's quite difficult to catch a glimpse of them. Orioles are active two hours after dawn and about an hour before sunset. According to 2020 records, their population in Mangastau region amounted to 2,374. Not so many, but there is still a chance of seeing this rare beast. They used to confuse the Orioles with mouflons, but the most recent genetic studies have shown that they are a different species. Trans-Caspian Uriol is included in the red list of Kazakhstan. Poaching for this beautiful animal is a criminal offense punished by up to three years in jail and a fine of several million tenge. The wind is the main enemy of a cameraman. We managed to get so close to an Uriol herd, but the strong gusts are shaking the camera. One of the main expedition targets is the Ustuot Saiga population. We are heading for the northern Ustuot, but unexpectedly we are forced to reroute. The information comes in that near the village of Beineo they found the remains of a Persian leopard. Once in a while they would register this rare beast entering Mangistau region from the territory of Turkmenistan. But during 2018-2020 the photo traps installed by the staff of the Ustjot Reserve started catching it on a regular basis. It was even given the name Tao Shiri.
We took its left front paw to collect samples for genetic research. It remains a mystery whether this is the famous Tao Shiri, whose pictures were all over the social networks and the media, and that regularly appeared on the territory of the Ustuot Reserve. Or it is a different leopard. Let's hope it's not our Tao Shiri. We will learn this in the nearest future. The expedition continues on its route towards the Danistau Chink. From Mangistau region, we are crossing over to Aktober region. The landscapes of the northern Ustuot are no less picturesque than these in its western part, but the vegetation is more steppe-like than desert. Near the parking lot, a crane family couple is taking a walk. Demoiselle cranes are included in Kazakhstan's red list. The main reason for their shrinking population is the plowing of virgin land. Swift sand grouses are flying out from under the wheels all the time. Of the birds of prey, step eagles are the most common. The marmot in between the grown chicks is their food supply. The early morning sleep is so nice, but it's time to get up before all the small animals hide from the daytime heat in the holes. A Pinacate beetle is in a hurry on some extremely important business. Let's not interfere. A Dion snake is hunting. It looks like it caught the smell of its prey. The snake doesn't pose any danger to humans, yet it is a formidable predator for the tiny jeboa. The latter is couching and trembling with fear. He got lucky this time. We scared away the snake and the jeboa is saved. Nightlife is taking its course. Scary and funny living creatures come to the surface from their burrows. Armed with flashlights, zoologists embark on a night hunt. Tarantula looks quite intimidating, but in fact for humans its bite is no worse than this of a bumblebee. A wolf spider's bite can also cause short-term itching. The flashlight pursuit of a midday gerbil is not easy, but so much fun. Here come the first saigar. After lambing, large saigar herds split into small groups, two, three and up to ten animals. The saigar's territorial distribution depends on many factors, foremost on the available feed resources, which in turn depend on weather and precipitation. In the Danistau's western section, you can get a very good idea of the region's landscapes and plant communities. Half an hour ago, we drove through an absolutely flat saltwater desert. After that, we crossed the dry steppe zone, and here we are in the foothills. Grass up to your waist. It's a gek, or an abasis, a filler, blue joint, and even some breed here and there. Sores are dry salt lakes covered with a treacherous crust. Stepping on it for the first time, it seems it will hold, but after going in far enough, you suddenly begin to sink. Heavily saline soils in deserts and semi-deserts are called takirs or dry type playa. Takir differs from sore by the cracked surface. 
desert landscapes alternate with dry steps. There are sections of sandy deserts with sand dunes. It seems that this land has accommodated all types of landscapes. People have long noticed the antiseptic properties of the Amal Paganum or Adraspan. In the past, guests coming to see local rulers were escorted through a special room filled with Adraspan smoke. From ancient times, people believe in the mystical power of Adraspan. Allegedly, it conjures evil spirits, so they burn it and fumigate living quarters or merchant stands in the market. Serato Karpus, or Rebelek in Kazakh, is the most nutritious grass around. Both domestic and wild animals love it. Rebelek is a succulent. It accumulates moisture in its tissue and saves animals during drought. For environmentalists, this is an important indicator of the ecological well-being of the northern steppes. Megacarpea is another valuable fodder plant. This plant is called Prongus odontalgica. Why odontalgica or anti-tooth ache? Maybe because they extract essential oil out of it. Probably everyone knows this plant. Rhubarb, compote and jam are well-known delicacies. In the northern Ostjord, average annual temperatures are lower than in its western part. There are more precipitation, richer soil and vegetation. Therefore, these ends are more favorable for Saiga. In the 1990s, its Ostjord population suffered more than others, mainly due to poaching. The feverish demand for Saiga horns due to the needs of Chinese medicine almost led the Ostjord group to complete extinction. Although the sea had retreated from here two million years earlier than from the western Ostjord, the Danistau Ridge still carefully keeps its traces. Ira, look, it's a shark tooth. Megalodon? I bet came across a valuable find. Fossil shark otters lived in these latitudes from 60 to 40 million years ago. Their body weight reached 8 tons. Compared to the otters, a modern white shark is merely a gudgeon. Today's rain is a rather rare case for the Ostjord. On the one hand, it's good, as it's much more comfortable to travel. On the other hand, it gives hope that the dry steppes will get green again and the Saiga will return to its favorite habitat. About a month ago, the animal counting specialists of the Bayan Shagan NGO registered about 4,000 Saiga on this plane. Since that time, the steppe has dried up. The Shagan River has almost completely disappeared. We are in the middle of a pretty dry year. Thus, the Saiga went somewhere for more fodder. The further north we go, the more often we come across Saiga. The largest group so far had about 40 animals. By fall, females with grown youngsters will gather in large herds once again. Saiga is the oldest representative of the so-called mammoth fauna. Whereas mammoths and saber-toothed cats are extinct, the Saiga managed to survive to this day. 
The International Union for Conservation of Nature classified the Saiga as under critical condition. In Kazakhstan, thanks to enhanced security measures, over the past two years, their number has doubled. In the spring of 2021, the National Ministry of Ecology, Geology and Natural Resources published the figure of 842,000 hands. Saiga can live with a minimum of water, yet nursing females still need more water. They get it from the Shagan River. In spring, when melt snow flows from the Danistau slopes, it is a real river with a strong current. In summer, it splits up into multiple old dead river channels where water remains until the fall. This is where the Saiga concentrates in the summertime. We are following the bottom of the Shagan River. This year it dried up almost completely with only a few small puddles left. One of the projects in which I participate represents a new approach to wild animal conservation. It's community-based wildlife conservation. They widely use it in Africa, Central Asia and North America. Here in the northern Qing section of the Ostiot Plateau, local residents from several villages united in a single organization and collaborate with the environmental police, Okonzo Prom inspectors and Aktobe region's territorial inspection. When the project began in 2017, the Ustuot Saiga population was about 3,000. By now, it has quadrupled. We will spend the night near the natural landmark called the Meteorite. The long stone in the middle of the plateau does seem like an alien object, but most certainly it's a residual outcrop. Once there were high mountains around, time had destroyed more fragile rocks, but this stone has remained as a monument to bygone eras. This is our last night in the field. Tomorrow, we will set in a course for the village of Begembet, where Dusike Aga lives. After the harsh romance of traveling through the desert, a shower and a delicious hot lunch seemed like the greatest benefits of civilization. I was born and raised here, finished school. Then I entered the university, went to different places for work and then came back to my native land. Now I'm engaged in farming, exactly what my ancestors used to do. No one forced me. It was our own idea to establish the Bayan Shagan Association and we did it. Our main goal is to protect the nature and animals. We want our grandchildren and great-grandchildren to enjoy the nature of their native land. We are sure that Duisin Bekaman and Aybek Razgaliev will definitely succeed. The Saiga will delight the eyes of their children and grandchildren as well as will attract more tourists, bringing a decent income for the village residents. For today, our expedition is over. Follow our other travels in the social media accounts of the Kazakh TV channel.